Hello, everyone. This is another Freedom to Feel conversation, and my guest today is the amazing Frank Healing. He is a highly respected, licensed professional counselor and experienced life coach with a profound commitment to healing individuals transform their lives. With over 40 years of dedicated practice in the fields of counseling and coaching, Frank Healy has become a trusted guide for countless people on their journeys toward healing and personal growth. So there's a lot more to say here about Frank. Frank has a highly superior autobiographical memory. Uh, he has remembered every day of his life since he was six years old, and he's now 63. He was a research subject at the University of California due to his unique condition. Not only that, also Frank is, is the author of Heal Your Memories, Change Your Life, Revised Edition, heal the past to move on to a phenomenal present and future. But not just this book, he has other several books, which I'll have, I'll, I'll list him here on the podcast notes. So this is my brief introduction of you. I know your bio is much longer than that. We'll be at the end of the this video, the long, longer bio. But the question that I love asking pretty much all my guests, Frank, uh, from the after reading the, the brief bio, is how would you describe yourself in this moment? Who is Frank in his own words? Well, I'm a very, you know, w with my memory, it's, uh, I remember every day of my life since, as you had mentioned, since I was six years old. That includes uh, the day of the week, dates where, the weather, personal events, news events, as well as the emotional impact of each day. And that is what kind of led me into, uh, so when people first hear that, they think, oh, that is really neat. Mm -hmm. You remember, yes. Yes. not just with your wife, but every kiss you've ever had, you probably remember every detail of vacations and fun with friends and all. Well, that is true. I also remember a lot of the not so happy stuff, like uh, bad days at work, romantic breakups, before I was lucky enough to meet my wife for 14 years now. And uh, remember, and remembering all that with the same emotional impact, when a memory comes up into my head, which they do pop into frequently, yeah. uh, it, it feels as it would feel as if the incident were still happening right now. So I so instead of being an accountant or a economist good with numbers and all, I decided, uh, I needed to learn how to let go of the emotional impact of the bad memories and keep the good ones since I'm not going to let go of any of the feelings regardless. So, uh, and it also made me very compassionate and my memory is expansive enough so that I can relate to just about anything somebody might be, go through or feel. And so that all help, helped me lead, lead me into the field of counseling and psychology and life coaching, um, you know, so, it's, so that's what kind of led it. And uh, I know when I uh, first wrote to you, I was still 63. I turned 64 on May 21st. Oh, yeah, wonderful. So. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, welcome. yes. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I was about to ask, actually, intuitively, I was about to say, ah, oh, hopefully he's still 63. But yes, so 64 now, that's amazing the um how some people have i call them superpowers these you know different ways of relating to reality perceiving reality um which i think memory has a, a lot to do with that so it's fascinating that some of us have these gifts and some don't have you thought about that the reason why because there's is unknown right the the cause of highly superior autobiographical memory well, it's still being researched because they haven't found a definitive cause. There's been some theories, like uh, some of uh, some have said that we don't we don't have the filter in our minds that most people have, mm -hmm. where you forget a lot of things you'd like to forget about, but then you can also forget some good things too. And uh, it's been uh, it's been hypothesized that maybe we have a form of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and uh, I don't I don't really agree with that. And if we do, it's mild because uh, you know recent you know I don't I mean I 
a little, like when I go out to eat, um, just a little bit of a germ phobe, but I'm not one to go around touching light switches five times before I leave the house. There's not any of that. Yes, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're not, you don't focus on the cause. So that's not something that preoccupies, that concerns you, which is wonderful too. Yeah. The idea of living in the present is so, it's very attractive, isn't it? We all want to be here now. That's, um, a spiritual practice as a, as a fact, as a matter of fact, one that I, I very much, because of the traumas that I have had, I have chosen to do that, go on a path, spiritual path, be more present with what is present and less um, dwelling my own thoughts and memories. So for trauma survivors, what is, um, I know we'll be talking, the topic is gratitude, actually. Gratitude can help you heal your memories. But uh, talk to me for a moment before that, Frank, about trauma, uh, trauma survivors like myself. Do you like this approach? Do you, um, do you find it helpful? Like in my case, focus, focusing, being here more than, you know, giving attention to memory. Well, yes, I think it's, uh, you know, some of the things I even do with my clients, some grounding exercises to help them, yeah. uh, you know, help them get get back into the present moment if they have a flashback to a scary time or, uh, you know, focus now. For anyone who disassociates, then, uh, right. well, I help people with that too, and you should be in therapy if you have that. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to, uh, you know, ground yourself in the moment, like be mentally present. You know, I'd include the word mentally because some people watching or listening might be thinking, well, how can you not be present? Well, of course, you can only be physically present, but I mean being mentally present in the moment and thinking, uh, okay, what can I do right now? You know, what, what am I doing? And, uh, and, of course, you can also be present even if you don't have any obligations in that moment. Focus on some good music or a good YouTube video or a show like this, you know, and uh, staying right in the moment. So it is, it is something that's very helpful, but not really pushing away the memories. It's one thing that I don't do when they come, I just let them come and do what they do, which they bring feelings. Yeah. Of the past. And then I just let them come and go. And I don't, I don't attach, I don't act upon them. Not anymore. I used to be re very reactive, but not anymore. So I'm wondering, because I've never done therapy, so I'm wondering if that was, um, we never know what really has helped us, right, Frank, in a way. There are so many factors, so many things that, that we do that we cannot pin down sometimes. Yes. Well, you know, a lot of times uh, people who have been through trauma have a lot of good qualities, like uh, you're resilient and strong and empathetic. Mm -hmm empathetic yeah. toward people but that itself you know you've heard the term empath you need to put a cap on it sometimes so you don't burn yourself out empathizing with others but at least sympathize understand True. how people <laughs> feel and uh and a lot of time well it's kind of, it might seem kind of an enigma like on the one hand when you've been through a lot of trauma you can become tolerant of a lot of things but at the same mm -hmm. time you can become tough and don't tolerate any abuse from others mm. Mm, yes, it can go one way or another. I know you mentioned bullies, right? People have been bullied, abused as, a ch as children. They usually become less, um, let's say, afraid and kind of more hesitant in life, doubtful, fearful, or they become bullies too, which is the other side of that, another kind of abusive. So that's... Um, and we never know why, too, right? Uh, people go one way or another. Yeah, so I think part of, uh, I mean, the way we respond to anything that's happened to our life, what everyone needs to remember is we still have choices. Mm. You know, we don't like, uh, you can choose to fall apart and be the victim if you've been bullied or abused in any way, like physically, sexually, uh, emotionally and verbally, you know, but, or you could choose to uh, use it as an mm. opportunity to, uh, to be, be strong and do better. Yes, yes, that is so true. Yes, has been my case. It took a little bit long to make that choice because it felt like I, I didn't have any choice, actually. 
you know, responding, coming from trauma, I felt like I was just uh, living this very reactive life, just um, doing things that I didn't want to do, but I didn't know why. There's no, I, didn't, I had no idea because I didn't have the knowledge about the trauma, how could it, it affected me. But yeah, once I became aware of the pattern, then it was easier to make choices. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, a lot of times when you are being abused, the uh, perpetrator will make you try and make you believe that you don't have choices. Mm. You know, and yeah. there's, and even a lot of times, uh, well meaning, pa there might be well meaning parents, but they raise their kids to like, this is the only path to follow. Right. Yes, Frank. Yes, we just said it was my case. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So going back to you, how did you first discover that you had this gift of highly superior autobiographical memory? I know I read chapter one in your book, um, Hear Your Memory, Change Your Life. So I have an idea. But for the audience, it would be wonderful for you could share that. Oh, yes. Well, it started when I was I was actually in kindergarten, and uh, well, since you already all already know my age, I can get into details. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, it was the end of February <laughs> and beginning of March, nineteen sixty six, and yeah. uh, I had I was homesick with chicken pox and too sick to even be up playing with toys, and so it happened that my uncle, who lived right down the street, my uncle Bill just to give me a calendar for that year. So I would, uh, so I spent the week staring at each block of a date and picturing and playing the tune in my head of what would be on prime time TV that night. Yeah. And uh, while well, knowing the prime TV lineup isn't anything remarkable for a five year old, but what I did with it was different, yes. <laughs> unusual. So that by end of that week, I realized Gee, I know, I, I know what day of the week every day this year is going to fall on. It's like, uh, Thanksgiving will be a Thursday. Fourth of July will be a Monday. Christmas will be a Sunday. And from then on, each day of my life, I made mental notes all day about, uh, this is happening on this date. Yeah. So it's, uh, in fact, one thing, uh, my 90 year old mother is kind of lonely because my mother, my father died in 2018 and I'm in New Jersey. She's in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So every day I text her a family memory of something that happened on this day of the year, one year. Ah, uh, what a gift to her that is, yes. right? Something, yeah, to rejoice, to remember. You see, members are wonderful when it comes to that. You know, they feel like, um, you're right. It feels like they're, they're here when we remember something positive, mm -hmm. something good. They just uh, tend to become real. So become our reality in this moment. So that's fascinating how we can change, let's say, the color of reality by thinking, by remembering, by imagining. And, you know, at some point, I don't even know the difference between memory and imagination because I don't know if they were Really, my memories really happened, all of them, like you do. So I kind of question them. Is that, am I imagining or this is um, really, really happened? So it's kind of fun to play with them at times, memory. Well, yes, it is. It is fun to play with memories. And as long as you're still doing all your obligations in your life, it's okay to spend some time <laughs> yes. daydreaming and playing with yeah. your memories because, you know, it can... Uh, and if and what what memories you choose to think about and play with can shape your beliefs and uh, how you do in life now. Yes. Oh my God, that's a big one. That's a chapter in your book. So it's chapter three: change your beliefs, change your life. Or oh, actually, chapter two: how your memories affect your beliefs. So you have that topic. Two chapters address that specific theme of belief systems. Yes. Um, so what was the uh, the main intention of writing your book? I know you wrote many books. I do have them here. The Ultimate Guide to Healing Your Past, Empower Yourself Through Your Memories is a part of a series. Uh, Stress-Free Success. That's a good one. Not a lot of people, they're striving for success, but making 
without stress is not an easy thing. So that's a very beautiful invitation. Emotional intelligence is another one. So you have, I think, three or four books on that. Uh, and then financial minimalism, that's an interesting one too, and many others. So I'll have that there. But what was the main intention, the main purpose of writing, Hear Your Memories Change Your Life, Frank? Well, I thought uh, it started in September of 2012. I was in a weekend conference in the Philadelphia Marriott that included Jack Canfield, the chicken soup guy, one of them. And uh, and somebody, we're, we're all talking about our books. We're, it was all authors there. Authors are aspiring authors. And, uh, you know, somebody mentioned that, uh, well, you have this memory and you're also in a healing profession and your last name fits mm -hmm. with that, Healy. So, <laughs> yes. So yeah. I thought, you know, and then I had, um, I talked to a couple people at the conference who had overcome some real adversity in their life. One of them is, one of them well, is featured in my book, Heal Your Memories, Change Your Life. And, uh, and so I, uh, and so I decided that could make a good self-help trilogy. So I thought, what does I do? I'll find people and interview them, uh, people who had had some real adversity in their life and, uh, but are now happy and thriving. So, and that's what I did for all three books. Uh, the first one, I got them out of newspaper articles, people at the conferences, and the other two I got from, I put an advertisement in Harrow, help a reporter out, and got some good responses. So I've interviewed people, been through bullying, career sidelining injuries, uh, rape on the streets, in, the, in city streets. Uh, I've interviewed people who uh, had to, people who grew up in a war zone and uh, all that messed up with their family. And uh, so, and I found some amazing, interesting people and they were all very cooperative and excited and happy to be interviewed and be featured in a book. A few of them I still keep in touch with now. Yes. What is, um, what is spirituality to you? How do you view this whole concept? Well, I, I, I do have Christian faith, but I'm open to, minded to any spiritual practice that both helps somebody and motivates them to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, one of my other less well-known books, the, a short book, The Enlightened Teen, was about how uh, when I was 16 years old, I went from being a... Uh, a real competitive kid and self-absorbed. I got to be the best student. I got to have to excel in all the activities to being someone uh, at peace, feeling connected to everyone and everything. And the compassion just grew. And after the fact, I read Pierre Telhard de Chardin, how I believe and thought, oh, so this makes sense now. It's spirituality, not necessarily emotion, but spirituality. And, uh, you know, I, so it's a, and when you really, and sometimes spirituality, I think, can go so deep that uh, it can serve to prove that language is not always a perfect form mm -hmm. of communication. It's, but the masters like Deschardin, even Buddha and Thomas, Thomas Merton really, uh, you know, just describe it well. It's uh, kind of like you get out of your ego and just be so connected and loving toward everyone and everything even. Yes, yeah, that would be the expression, manifested expression of that. Yes, in the yes. human body. Yes, that's that sounds very accurate to me. Yeah. So let's go back to the topic. Gosh, I have so many um, of these questions here and going off a bit. But so the topic is gratitude can help you heal your memories. And you talked there, you talked about self-pity, which I immediately um, kind of remembered when I used to do that. Um, feel like a victim and, you know, everything. I, I was blaming everything and everyone for the way I felt. So talk to me about the relationship between Pity, self-pity, and memories, and also gratitude, self-pity, and memories. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, well, well, I think you can you can look at any memories really uh, as to be grateful for them. Even then, like if you're just starting to practice gratitude, first thing is 
be grateful for even everyday things like uh, the ability to see, hear, and walk, grateful to friends, for friends, spouse, fa support of family, and uh, so starting with a lot of these things that might seem obvious. And so a lot of people will say, yeah, I'm grateful, but they don't really dwell on it enough to uh, mm. to, to, to really get the feeling inside. And uh, yes, when you have all that, and uh, especially if you include in that, your ability to do certain things, the self-pity will kind of automatically go away. I mean, gratitude and self-pity really like oil and vinegar. They can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's you know, and true. Memories <laughs> can come up like uh, they start out with obvious mem memories that would be easy to be grateful for, such as nice vacations, your nice home, and uh, things like that. You're your nice car, things like that, and pets and all, as well as people. And then maybe move toward the memories you didn't like that much. And well, I'm so, I'm so grateful I didn't, I was let go from that job because now I have a much better job that I wouldn't have had hmm. otherwise. Or right. one, one person I interviewed in the book, uh, in one of my books said uh, he was going to be a police officer, but then one night he was riding his motorcycle and a car hit him and uh, enabled his, le his leg and uh, injured his leg to where there was no possibility of that anymore. But now he said his wife would not have married him if he was a police officer because it's too much risk to be killed every time you go out on the job. So... So a lot of it can be blessings in disguise that you can be grateful for. And I think it's also grateful if something really, uh, real, real, really not so, that seems not so great is happening to you right then. You might not be able to see the good in it right then, but it's useful to assume that good will come out of it. Mm, yeah. Like a little over four years ago, I, I was about to turn 60 and my wife and I had planted a Western planned a Western Caribbean cruise, and uh, then COVID hit. And meanwhile, there was a lot of riffraff going on in the job that I had. And uh, so so they let me go with a right before a birthday that might have been uh, made it harder to find a new job. But fortunately, I, I pulled some connections. And now my full-time job is uh, with a lot of people I know knew already and uh, mm -hmm. And the, the really amazing yeah. thing about it is the building is a converted house that's the same architectural design as the shore house we had when I was growing up. So it's like my office is in my sister's bedroom and uh, across the hall is my old bedroom. <laughs> That's amazing. Speaking yeah. of memories, right? Yeah. Now it's it's easier <laughs> to yeah. remember when you are right there anyway. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a powerful, another insightful, powerful message from you, Frank, that we can turn any circumstance, any experience into a lesson. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to try to, um, let's say, uh, trying to transform something that happened that was unpleasant and, you know, painful in my case, I try not to, to, you know, convert that into something good. But I do love the idea that I have learned a lot from it, in a sense of protecting myself, you know, yeah, especially for the last 20 years. Yeah, protection, self, uh, self-love, self-compassion and boundaries. They, they were big, big foundational to build the life that I have now. So yes, that's a powerful lesson lessons though. That's that's something that most people don't don't think, right? We don't often think when we are going through challenging situations. In the moment, we tend to see only the, you know, how painful it is and kind of stay there. I love what you said about dwelling. You see, I never heard it that way, that most people don't dwell uh, enough in gratitude to generate the feeling. So it's almost as if what you're saying, that feelings will make gratitude tangible in a sense of connecting. We'll connect deeper with people around us. Our relationships will be healthier and our environment, of course. So I love I love that and never heard it that way. Yes, well, you know, a lot of uh, 
I mean, people, uh, I mean, when I get up each morning, uh, I write out a gratitude list of, uh, at least five or six things, sometimes up to 10, but sometimes I'll include in that list, not only gratitude, but what I'm committed to and people I love. And, you know, it's, and so it's, gets a, it jump starts the day to a great start. And sometimes, it, I mean, it can be even uh, to get a little humorous about your gratitude. For instance, like, uh, well, I'm grateful that we have bowls and cups so that coffee and cereal don't spill out all over the place. And, uh, you know, it's, yes, uh, yeah, it, I like the sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> yeah. And if yes. you're, if you're doing uh, something, something silly, mm-hmm. you can be grateful that maybe your friends and family can't see what you're doing right at that moment. Yes. Why do we tend to remember our painful experiences more than the good ones. Naturally, we do that. I have an idea, of course, because I talked to many people, I read too much. But your perspective, I'd love to hear. Well, it's kind of uh, like re- relates to uh, evolution. I think in a way like, uh, you know, our thinking, thinking originally evolved for problem solving. So that if we don't control our thoughts, which most people don't do very much, uh, mm-hmm. Our thoughts will naturally gravitate toward an unsolved problem. Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of people have trouble sleeping at night. They'll uh, dwell on some problem that they haven't figured out the solution. So, uh, so no, so we have to actively uh, bring our uh, bring our thoughts to things we're grateful for, things we like that we're happy about. And you know, if you're dwelling on Dwelling on a problem a lot of time for too long, not only the longer you dwell on it, the more anxious or down or upset you'll get, but uh, you can get into a thing that we call in the counseling field the paralysis of analysis, where <laughs> yeah. you keep analyzing it to the point where you don't come up with solutions anymore. Yes, you're stuck, right? Doubtful, yeah. Yeah, so, well, you could even make a uh, like for people who have trouble sleeping, uh, what I would advise them to do is uh, write down a list of everything they might worry about or dwell on when they're in bed, and then put the piece of paper in a drawer. Which even that act makes you know makes you think and feel like, uh, okay, I'm done with this. Now it's time to just let myself go to sleep. Nothing I can do about mm-hmm. any of this now because it's and uh, then just let. And I emphasize the word let because you can't force yourself to go to sleep. You have to just let it happen for it to work. Yeah. How do you see that idea of the observer, um, Frank, it's psychology that has been discussed too, not just spirituality? Well, in a way, it's like, um, you know, you can, that's why one reason I think journaling is helpful because you write down your thoughts and even just do it spontaneously, whatever comes to your mind. And then you look at it and you get the sensation that the thoughts are on paper now, so they're not in my head anymore. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's another, yeah, it's a very good way to, <laughs> yes, which is known, right? Writing. I wrote my first mm-hmm. book because of that, too. I wanted to take them. And there was another change that I made mm-hmm. trying to survive psychologically, emotionally. So going back to gratitude. You have actually, you wrote steps to it, which is wonderful too. And you talk about writing, of course. Um, but I like the, the sequence. I start by a feeling, uh, feeling gratitude towards things that's easy to feel grateful yeah. for. Anything that's already, it's a given in a way. It's so easy to be, I mean, be grateful to be alive, to be yeah. here. That's, uh, it sounds like very easy, yeah. right? And natural to do, but not for some people, which is interesting. Yeah, so some people are about self-pity or dwelling on ways they felt cheated or uh, ripped shortchanged in life. You know, it's hard for them to get into that other state of mind. But with enough, well, it's like to get good at anything, you practice. Mm. Yes, 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 a billion times <laughs> to practice. So then the second, be grateful for something specific. I like that step too. So that's really getting down to things that you that you can name it, that you can it's tangible again. And then you, you talk about writing, of course, always create lists with them. And then next you pick a specific memory that you have enjoyed. 
And then now the toughest one is it's uh, being grateful for something that happened that you are ambivalent about, that you had mixed feelings about. You're, you're not sure if it was good or bad. Or even if something that you, you already believe that was not good, painful in my case, yeah. for example. And I remember trying to come up with all, you know, all the imaginative excuse I could, ideas about, oh, maybe I, I was here before in different lifetimes and maybe I did something bad to my parents and that's why they did this to me in this lifetime. Maybe I was bad to them in a different, so I created all these things in my mind to try to make the situation, you know, good or better or something. But that, that's something, of course, we do not uh, advise. No, you don't. No, I wouldn't say, I mean, don't make up reasons why it happens, especially reasons that say you deserve the bad. Mm, you know, it's yeah. much, much healthier to uh, look at it as a learning experience. Uh, somebody uh, once said, wrote that uh, you can look at life as a classroom, not as a courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's a good one. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> being judged, yeah. right? And being, yeah, that's, uh, hmm, that's an interesting way. Never thought of that way, too. So, yeah, and you mentioned as an example about your mother, you know, when your father passed away and what she said. Um, you need to get to the point where your father, thinking about your father in terms of his whole life, not just the death. So that that's a, another beautiful way of seeing yeah, it. Yeah, people tend to emphasize the death when they lose a loved one, but instead they could feel grateful for all the times they had with them. Yeah, seeing life as a whole, not just part of it. You see, that's something that can really, really help too. It, ha it helps me a lot, seeing the whole of life, not just yeah. parts. Another Something else that, uh, yeah, you do have lots of amazing exercises. They are so clear. I love the how well instructed they are, the exercise in the book. It's so easy to go through them. Uh, there was one that you sent to me that was about basically how to self-heal your memories questionnaire. So I have them here. Think about a time when you felt inadequate. What was going on? What specific feelings did you have? Yeah, so the idea behind uh, that exercise, you're, you're going to get into a meditative state and think about the good memory for a minute or two, but then think, you know, yeah. with all the sight sounds that you can remember, the, uh, the, the fe physical feelings, if there were any sense, and then think about that and then think about the bad memory for a shorter period of time and keep going back and forth. And eventually the good feelings from the good memory will kind of kill off the feelings from the bad memory. Mm, yes. So do they, is there a replacement or they completely dissolve? What happened to those well, memories? Different again, you'll probably still remember the bad memory, but yeah. you know, as I had talked about you, you know, when it pops up again, you might just not feel, so what? Okay, you won't feel anything about mm -hmm. it that you did before. And I'll have to say that's, that I created that exercise. It's a variation of neuro-linguistic programming that was popular in the 80s and 90s, but I put my own spin on it. Yeah, yeah. You see, that's, I call it, that's healing creativity to me yeah. in my eyes. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for being you. I know um, we're almost at the end. I want to mention something that caught my attention too, something that you read about therapy. You said therapy is no longer only about curing depression, anxiety, and addictions. Therapy now also includes learning techniques to use your mind to achieve your goals, achieve satisfaction in your life, and to improve overall quality of life. So I like that you, you said that because that is true. I do see therapy this way. That's a two sides to the same coin. I mean, why have it just be get rid of your depression and anxiety or, or control, control your moods more? How about moving to a happier, abundant life? Mm, yes, right. You can do it simultaneously. You can do two, two, those two yeah. things. Yes, right. Moving from one place to another. Yeah. And then you said something too. Another thing you said about um, 
being highly going back to that i have to go back see i don't have your memory <laughs> frank <laughs> i have to go back here on my papers highly superior author biographical memory so you said it is a gift because it brings with it the ability to recall many positive memories instantly and the ability to learn lessons from the memories that seemed negative i love i love the way you said that too seemed is almost like um you know there was the interpretation of that memory there was um perception so you see there's there's a touch of not of unrealness to it which is interesting to notice yes i put that word in because that that can make it lose some of its power over you right, it right. seemed and yeah, and a lot of spiritual people will even say it's all good. So the good and I mean, so because really, what is good or bad? Good, right. good, good is when things are happening the way you mm. like, and bad is when things are happening the way you don't like. That's really all good and bad is. Like from Hamlet, you know, nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm, yes, and we are the only species i believe that do that humans yeah that's right? right i mean the other animals just go on instinct you know i mean they might like uh for if, if, it's, if a dog's been abused a lot they might shrink from people but uh yeah. but but i think what it comes down to is we're the only ones who can uh decide that a memory that was painful could have a good lesson in it mm, oh yes yeah right because experiences they it's just we're all having them all the time, but you're right. The interpretation of that is the key. Ha. Huh. And, and you say, I have to go back to that too. I love the, uh, the idea of taking the realness out of certain things. And I do that in general, even from my spiritual practices, even the realness of experiences in general, I see them as a, like a dreams, a dream like reality, just so many mm -hmm. things happening. And, and it, it feels playful that way. It feels a lot more playful when I see them as just experiences. So it's almost like God's dream. I know that you are a Christian, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, that sounds so beautiful to me, you know, that we all, this is just God, God's dream. Yes, that's, I've, read, I've read that in some spirituality books too. Dream, God's dreaming through us. Right. So you have, yeah, so you have heard that before. Okay, yes, I, I found that to be so beautiful. So we're almost at the end. I do want to also mention your services. Your website is phenomenalmemory.com. It will be on the podcast notes and also services. So you offer one-on-one -on -one groups, uh, remote and in-person sessions, Frank. That's right. Okay. So all of that, all of it. Yeah, it's and all the way to be, the way to find you is your website. Yes. My, my website would be one way or I have no problem giving my email here. Mm, yes. It's, yes. Yeah, H, do you have it there? Or? Oh, I'll have it here, but you can say it too. That will help. Okay. It's H E A L, Healy's Heal One at MSN.com. Achilles mm -hmm. Healing, H E A L Y S H E A L, then number one at MSN.com. It's one of those. I've had that website for almost 24 years. You don't see too much MSN.com anymore, but. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. True, true. I'll have that email too. So I'll have the website okay, and great. the email. So both of them. Thank you. And before we say goodbye, I do have one more question for you. Would you like to read a passage in your book, Frank? I know we're almost at the end, but is there a passage that you'd like to read? Well, I think I'd rather, uh, uh, well, I'll just talk about some of my books. Uh, of course, yeah. Heal Your Memories, the trilogy we've talked about is uh, some, is, is uh, all about healing your memories and stress-free success, which I just put out last year. Mm. That's about achieving your goals, but de-stressing yourself at the same time, sort of getting the best of all worlds. So there's a lot of different, uh, and if you even go to my author central page or type my name into Amazon, the books will all come up. Yes, I'll have that here too. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I'll have the specific link to the book that we spoke of and then the author's page on Amazon. Yes. So thank you so much for your presence, mm -hmm. for doing what Pleasure. you're doing, uh, for sharing the gift. That's really, I think that's what we are here for. If there's a, a purpose to this life, it would be that one, to guide others to a place of peace and happiness if we have found it. 
or at least we've found the path, right, Frank? It yeah. might not be a, a destination, but perhaps a journey. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing what you do. And the, my last question for you, I do have, I'll ask you this one. I have too many, so I'll ask you this one. Uh, what is freedom? How do you see this idea, concept of freedom? What does it look like for you? Well, I see freedom as we can choose our thoughts and feelings. That's definitely something that we're not taught growing up. But I think freedom yeah. is... We can choose how we think and feel and what we do in any situation, but sure, it's not the things we do, there's consequences, but uh, we can decide to feel good even if we're, even if everything's not exactly the way we like. And, uh, you know, so that's what I really think freedom is, uh, being in control of our thoughts and feelings. Mm, yes, wow. It, that is the reason why this platform is titled Freedom to Feel, yeah. because of um, I have interviewed so many therapists and scientists of the mind, and that came up so many times that it had to be the title of this um, yeah. video interview platform. Thank you so much again yeah. for your presence, for being you, and for everything that you're doing, and we'll be in touch again. Okay. Bye for now. Thank you. Dear Frank.